Welcome to Strange Familiars. If you've seen something strange, a cryptid like Bigfoot, ghosts, UFOs, anything paranormal, and you'd like to tell your story, you can email us, strangefamiliarspodcast at gmail.com. We also have a voicemail line, 717-347-8554. You can call and leave a message. If you get cut off, you can call back and continue your story. Tonight I will be welcoming Clint from OK Talk back to the show. He's going to be going over some various experiences he has had in the Boggy Creek area. He'll be playing some audio of some strange screams and other sounds, and we'll be talking about a very strange print that appeared on Clint's car as well. And before we get to Clint, I would like to thank our patrons. Thank you, patrons, every single one of you. You make Strange Familiars possible. Without our patrons, we could not do the show. If you would like to help us make Strange Familiars and get extra content besides, you can become a patron at Patreon. That's patreon.com slash strangefamiliars. We do one full episode of Strange Familiars every month for our patrons. Sometimes we do more than that. Some months we've done as many as three shows for our patrons. Go ahead and check it out. Again, that's patreon.com slash strangefamiliars. There are a bunch of different levels of support there. Starting at $3 a month, you get the bonus content, and other levels include things like copies of my books, copies of my music, t-shirts, and more. If you do not like the idea of a monthly subscription like Patreon and you still want to help, in the show notes at strangefamiliars.com under every episode is a paypal.me link where you can make a one-time donation. Everyone can help by sharing the show on social media, by liking and subscribing to Strange Familiars wherever you're listening, and by leaving us those nice five-star reviews, which help get the podcast in front of new listeners. Tonight we're talking to a rare, rare cryptid who seldom makes appearances but we're always happy when he does. After many, many months of ghosting us and ghosting his own fans of his own podcast, leaving us all in anticipation, I'd like to welcome back Mr. Clinton Granberry. Two strange familiars. I'm tentatively poking my head out from behind a tree in a distant wood line. It's blurry. Yeah, well, I mean, creatures of great significance usually are. Absolutely. Clint, how you doing, man? I'm doing very well, Timothy. My man, I don't know if your listeners know this, dude, but you really are the best person in this weird, weird, weird community that we uh, have somehow found ourselves waiting in. And <laughs> I just want to say to all the listeners of The Strange Familiar do what you can to support this guy because nobody works harder than Timothy and uh, nobody the dude doesn't have a trunk full of snake oil that he's trying to sell you if the guy's putting it out there like it's on point and you're the best Tim you're thank you best. brother thank you that's that's a high compliment and I was having a little fun there but uh Clint has been working on stuff. He's just been working behind the scenes. You got some, um, we can't talk too much about it, but besides the, the Devil's Creek documentary. Well, that, I thought, I thought you know what, like, uh, we might as well go ahead and just like spend like a couple of minutes on Devil's Creek because people do ask. Oh yeah. And I totally, yeah. I totally understand. Um, and some of the things that we're going to talk about tonight, people will be able to take a peek at, at Devil's Creek film.com so basically here's where we're at people you know we went we shot we have hours and hours and hours of footage and it's great we 
are in post-production at the moment. And like our initial round of funding covered the trip and everybody getting up there. The post-production has been a little bit more tedious as it's kind of uh, coming as we, as we can make it happen. And I honestly don't like, I want it to be the best that it can possibly be. So we're not slapping it together. It's not like me and a high school buddy from down the street on my laptop working on it. So we have a couple of different video editors that are combing through material at the moment because we had so much footage that was taken actually in the woods at night during the day of the forest in an area that has reportedly had a lot of weird things happening that we literally are going through it frame by frame. And uh, I've obviously getting someone to take a look at all of that isn't free. So we have people that are going through all of the footage. You know, I'm always working on the backstory. It's coming. We have a couple of ideas for some various things related to the project in terms of like ways that people can continually stay involved. Obviously, like if you're just hearing this for the first time and you're interested in supporting an independent documentary about the most insane, crazy, scariest place that you could ever imagine in human existence, <laughs> go to devilscreekfilm.com. We, it's not, it's the other one, not the Kickstarter, but the. Yeah. And, and if people haven't heard like the, the sort of whole Devil's Creek story, I mean, you've gone over it throughout many episodes of OK Talk. We covered it on a dip in Devil's Creek on Strange Familiars. You can find that episode. So the story's out there. And well, and the story, the full story is yet to be told. That's the the really interesting thing. I have a little a little behind the scenes knowledge, and the full story is quite interesting. It's it's quite interesting, and and I'll I'll go ahead and say that maybe you know, you, you can you can comment on this as much as you'd like, but maybe the story you thought you were going to film when you went up there was not the story that you came back with like many things in life when you pull the string and stuff starts to unravel it reveals things that you never imagined possible and that is what has happened at every single turn with devil's creek mm -hmm. and it happened with the filming that has gone on up there it's happened with the stuff that's happened after the fact in fact i can't wait to tell people part of the story of me calling you right on the phone from the hotel in Seattle and the hours that we spent there where my brains were leaking out of my ear holes and you were basically trying to catch them with a pan. And, and we're uh, just unraveling parts of it kind of as we're speaking. You know, it is like real time things. Literally are you this guy right here, Tim Renner, played a massive role in figuring something out. And uh, our relationship developed as things <laughs> unfolded. And it really is, look, I think that I realize people are like, man, when's it coming out? I'm ready to see the movie. And what's, what's going on with the movie? Look, this is a story that isn't like, it's not like we're doing a documentary about the Lake Worth monster. Right. And, I'm saying like, oh, in 19, whatever the heck, this happened and this happened and this happened and here's your movie. Yeah, like if that was the case, it would be simple. This is something completely different and it'll be worth the wait. It'll be worth the payoff. And oddly enough, um, it in and of itself, as has everything with our podcast, OK Talk, has opened up new doors and shown us new game trails through the forest underneath satellite imagery. So it's, it's, it's not even like that. The story hasn't been fully told. The story is not completely done. It's active. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. But anyway, I want to tell, you know, we have a lot of crossover listeners. I get emails from people all the time and comments on the pod that are like, so glad I found you through strange familiars. And I really appreciate that. I just, there's a reason why y you, you know, this is a place where I like to come and speak 
and talk about things and, and, and any help anybody wants to give, I really appreciate it. But just like with everything else, uh, you know, and no promises, I'm not putting dates on stuff because I'm not going to disappoint people. And number one, because we didn't have some massive campaign that netted us way more money than we needed beforehand. And right, right. And the, the it's story is, case, it's, man, it's the, organic. The story is far more interesting and far more complex than a monkey in the woods. And we'll just leave it at that. True that. Yeah. True that. I mean, it includes that. It includes that. Don't get me wrong, but it's... Most definitely does include that. Right. And it's funny that you would say that because I think what you and I are going to discuss here in a minute obviously led me to Devil's Creek, which is, again, it's all part of this vast tapestry of like things that blow my mind constantly when I start to think about it and what we're going to discuss tonight and break to the world, which I think will be significant. Mm -hmm. As you have said, it would be, you think it's pretty significant. And Josh has said he thinks it's pretty significant. Yeah. Yeah. All of this stuff is connected and I don't know how I don't pretend to know how, and that's maybe kind of why, that's where I am. Like, if you're looking for somebody to tell you what's going on, don't come to me, man, because the more that I figure out, the less I know. That's, that's all. I know. That's the honest answer, though, with all this stuff. That's the, the, the only honest answer. And somebody who's going to tell you they know exactly what it is. Beware of that snake oil salesman. Most definitely. Most definitely. That's Dorothea Wizard of Oz business. So, uh, you want to talk about Falk, Arkansas for a minute? I do. I do. Do Should we start with the most recent thing and kind of work backwards? Yeah, if you want to, yeah, we could definitely do that. All right. So, so, so what was the date that you sent me this? Like, you called me and you were like, I don't even know what to do with this. So, what was the date of so that? That, that? That would have been the end of September. End of September. So, okay. Yeah. And, uh, Maybe I think actually like the event occurred on September the nineteenth. Okay, all right. So, and you were the first person I contacted because, yeah. honestly, to to be perfectly honest with you, the community at large is I didn't want anyone else involved with because I knew of the roadblocks and the insanity that would come. I mean, dude, I have a podcast where we talk about weird stuff and I didn't even want to break this on my podcast. Like that's how, <laughs> that's how like, I don't even want people to know. So I get a phone call from Clint and he's like, I'm going to send you something. And he's, and you're pretty bewildered at this point. You're like, I, I don't even know what to do with this. I want to send you something. I just saw this. I was in Falk overnight and like this happened and you send me these photos. And at first I'm looking at them on my phone. I'm like, those look really impressive. And then I got to the computer and I blew them up and I was like, wow, these look pretty amazing. So it was a handprint. You got a handprint on your car that you didn't, you didn't notice until you were driving. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I was actually uh, doing a little cross country trip, working on a few different things. And it just so happened that I timed it out where it was kind of, uh, I was going to be, close to Texas early evening, but rather than make the extra like five hour drive or whatever home, I thought about swinging by and seeing my buddies down at the Boggy Creek Beehive, which is in Falk, Arkansas, which is the place, the actual location where the first thing that ever occurred to me that got me into this whole thing started. And the guy who not to confuse people you can refer to me as clinton and uh clint harris owns the boggy creek beehive so i called clint up and i said i was swinging by just wanted to see my friends they're great people and that's a great place and so i drove in right at sunset make the little drive down essentially it's like a little turn off down south to the Doddridge. Falk area right next to the massive, massive nature preserve that's down there. 
And the thing is, I wasn't going down there to do any kind of whooping or any of this business. I just wanted to hang out with Clint and them and uh, lay my head down in a bed as I'd been literally in my car for three days. So uh, we did what we do. We sat on the porch and he and his lovely wife were out. We hung out late into the night. Clint and I did take a little walk and we kind of reminisced about some of the things that had occurred there in the past. And, and I'm not going to tell you that I didn't scream into the woods, but I'm going <laughs> to tell you that nothing happened. Right. Right. And, right. And that wasn't your main focus of this night. You were, you just not at all. Yeah, yeah. Not at all. I just wanted to go by and see my buddy. The thing is that they have a little girl and I also was looking at the prospect of dealing with traffic into the Metroplex where I live here in North Texas the next morning. So I wanted to get out of here, get out of there early. So I told them when we laid down, I slept up in the loft and I was like, Hey man, like I'm going to be gone when you're, when you get up, but you know, love you. appreciate you all that, but I'll see you. So my alarm goes off. I think it must've been around four o'clock in the morning. And I grab my bag, slide out the door without making too much of a racket. For people who don't know, this area is about as sparsely populated as a pl- of a place as, as I've seen. And, you know, Falk has a gas station in it. But this is actually a good 10-minute drive from the Monster Mart, if you've ever seen that south. The Monster but, Mart is like, that's the gas station itself? Or, right, right. Yeah, okay, yeah. So, and it's kind of themed because of the, the Legend of Oh, Bobby yeah. Too. Oh, yeah. It's great. And if you're into this sort of stuff, or even if you're not, and you're making a road trip and you want to go to some place, do some destination travel, some legend tripping, go to the Monster Mart, man. Like, it's amazing. They've got a museum in there. They're expanding onto it. It's, it's, a, it's a fantastic location. But um, where the actual Crabtree people live, who were the family that was involved in the original story of the Falk monster right. that ended up being the movie, those people were actually in the original film. That is a, a little bit south of where the gas station is. That neighborhood backs up to a swamp area that is about 18,000 acres of just nothing well, that you literally, there's not a bridge across it. You have to drive all the way around it. If you want to get on the other side, I mean, there's nothing out there. And I snuck out, got to my car and pulled out on the road. There was a really cool moon situation going on. I stopped and took a couple of pictures of, some places lit up in the middle of the night and I needed to grab gas before I hit the interstate. And so I'm guessing that it must have been, I say that I got up at four. It it may have been like, it may have been five. They were just opening the monster Mart when I got there, pulled in, going to get some gas, grabbed a drink. And I'm kind of like just looking at the, uh, like I said, they've made advancements to the uh, collection of things there. They got footprints, the whole bit. It's an amazing place. But so when I got back in the car, and here it is, I'm about to drive to Texas. I guess it's just because of the way that the lighting was in particular. And my phone, I again am a modern day human and now rely far too much on Apple Maps <laughs> on my phone to tell me where to go. And this place is so far out in the middle of nowhere that it, you know, it's spotty at best. I mean, shoot, I can be in downtown Dallas and it not know what street I'm on. It certainly has a difficult time knowing which direction I'm pointed in Falk, Arkansas. So I'm, I'm trying to figure my way out to get back up to the interstate. And like, I don't have my glasses on and the sun hasn't come up yet, but it's close. And I pull up to a stoplight the stoplight there right and like i look right like i'm trying to bend my head down to look up at the street sign and read it and figure out which street i'm on and as i do so i notice 
an image <laughs> on my windshield. And uh, it's weird because this is the last thing that I was expecting to happen, period. Right? Like, but just like the thing that happened before in Falk that I laughed about, I'd never expected that to happen. But this really threw me off because where Clint's place is, I'm not kidding when I say that there may be a total of 200 people that live in the area, period. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, I may be overshooting it. I don't know. There may be 600 people in Doddridge, but this isn't a neighborhood like in the suburbs or whatever. There are all, all of these people have a lot of land. It's real spread out. And you would have to be crazy in the middle of the night to walk onto someone else's land, period. Like, right. right? That'd be the dumbest thing ever. Cause... Yeah, there's there's places you do not do that. <laughs> yeah. No, no. I mean, this is the South, and those people down there, they have guns for a reason. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, people walking onto their yard aren't necessarily the reason. They would just be casualties of the situation. <laughs> right. <laughs> I guess it was just the way that the street light, which was still illuminated, was shining down for whatever reason. As I'm looking up, I notice, like you said, man, like a handprint on my windshield. It's a big, like oily, like a greasy handprint. It looks like something been eating, you know, pizza or something, you know? Right. Yeah. I And I, it took me aback so much. And people who know me and whatever, right? Like I'm used to being in places that are weird and have experiences that are strange. This threw me off so much that I like yanked my car into uh, the nearest parking lot that I could find, which was like in front of a bank, the bank there. And I get out of my car and I'm looking down and look, it's a handprint. And the lighting is weird. It was tough to, like, figure out how to see it. And then it became eminently more difficult to figure out how to photograph it. Yeah, yeah. I, I actually, at one point, took <laughs> – I took a piece of uh, – I got a piece of poster board in my car. And I'm holding the poster board out with my left arm with my body hanging in my car, pointing it up. With the flash on, hoping that that somehow would right. you could see the shadow of it, but I did get an angle where I was able to get some really good pictures. The thing that is strange to me is the positioning of the print. Is if if let's just imagine a world where there is a monster that is seven or eight feet tall, right? Let's just imagine it. Just just. Suspend disbelief, <laughs> ye strange familiar listeners. It looks like something that was tall walked past my car and set its hand down on my windshield. Right? Like, it's not the way that the print is. It's not like a, I put both my hands on your window and I'm looking in your window. Mm -hmm. If I was going to do that, I do that at the driver's on the driver's side window, you know, or right, right. the passenger side window or hell, even on the back window on my hatch. Right. Like you want to see what's in the back of my SUV. That's how you would do it. This is a. Oh, it's odd because the three like the super long three fingers are really prominent in the handprint. Mm -hmm. But it is like if you took your right hand and you're standing on the driver's side of a car and you placed your hand on it above the steering wheel, that's the handprint that's on the car. And just the angle of that, like to get to that position, you would have to be super tall. Yeah, you're a tall guy yourself. How tall are you right, again? Like, I'm 6'5". Right. And it's not a um, – it's something that I can physically do. Mm-hmm. But it's not something that serves any purpose. Right. Right. Like, right. And it honestly, unless, I guess, if you, if I was, I would have to be about a foot taller and I was walking and I maybe if I stumbled and I placed my hand there, maybe, mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. right? But so the weird thing about this is, and I told you this, Tim, I own a production company and I'm driving into Falk, Arkansas as the sun's going down. So I call Clint and I'm like, hey man, I'll be there in like 20 minutes. I'm in Texarkana or close to Texarkana. I want to take video of the drive with this kick-ass sunset going down, right? So what's the one thing that I do? I clean my windshield like crazy, right? Like I'm like squeegee in the outside, but I also take my towel. I'm on the inside of my windshield cleaning it because I want to like drive and be able to have my dashboard cam going. Right. And I'm shooting B roll of this famous location. So that's the thing that dawned on me Mm -hmm. as I'm sitting there trying to take photos of it is that, I remember you telling me. I remember you telling yeah. me that day. You said, I just cleaned my windshield before I came in. I just cleaned it. I just cleaned it. It, 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 it was it, not it, there before. No, the night went down like this. I clean all of it. I get out of my car, and I don't go back to my car until that morning where I literally opened the door quietly, shut it quietly, and got out of there so that I didn't disturb anyone. Mm-hmm. And... You know, the funny thing is, is as a uh, connoisseur of podcasts that, of this ilk, right, I remember maybe there was like, maybe it was a Bigfoot show episode or there was definitely a pod from back in the day about this car that, you know, one of the uh, dermal, the gosh, I can't remember these people's names anymore now, you know, but mm-hmm. like uh the guy who was the dermal ridge expert, right? Right, like the right. The FBI guy or whatever. The, there was somehow there was a car that had like a print on it. I seem to remember that. Right, and they like wanted to get it, and they they I think they maybe they bought it like it was an old junker or but they removed the glass and like put it in this thing and all these people who like. You know, they need the freaking needle in the haystack to, like, prove their life, let alone the existence of some monster. They like, mm-hmm. need to validate their <laughs> the things that they've done with their free time. <laughs> and and these are – you're right. These are people that are here, right? Like, these are North Texans. Like, you know, I know people up here who are those people. Right. And what did I tell you? You were like, man, like you should try to get a print of it. And I was like, I, 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 I'm not even lying, Tim. I made like fingerprint powder. Mm -hmm. I went through this whole exhaustive process, like trying to pull it off with the tape and everything. But you know what? Like, here's the thing. Like, that handprint showed up on that car. That's what I know. I don't know what what the heck put it there. Mm -hmm. And I don't feel like telling anyone this benefits me in any way, shape, or form, except the thing that I think benefits people is that if you're into this weird stuff, like, this is weird. The immediate thing that my the guy that I own this company with, we were talking about it, and he was like, he was in town and we were at a hotel and he was like, you know, the weird thing is like, here's my hand, right? Like, and I stick my hand on this glass door right here. Like you see my fingerprints, but it's not like my whole hand shows up. Right. right? And then like, and he commented that it even looks like you could see where like hair, it right? Did like, look, it did look like that. Yeah. If you look at it closely, it looks like you can see hair. Right. So <laughs> the thing is, man, like, I told you on the phone, I was like, dude, I'm not contacting anyone because I don't want the circus over here. Right. And that's exactly what would happen. You know, you know what I'm saying? Like I sent you those pictures. Yeah. And if I sent that to the people of North Texas, Bigfootery, (laughs) what do you think would happen? People would be taking off vacation days to come over here and try to like, I can't like, I just wasn't interested in it. Yeah, no. I mean, I, it, I made some attempts to uh, remove it, but the thing is, uh, even in late September in Texas, it's really warm. And, I mean, it was fading 
you know, within a couple of days. Mm -hmm. I left it there as long as it would stay. It's kind of funny because I thought it was funny that this great piece of gold was there. But because of the humidity in the area, right, like it was already like there was dew on my car and in the inside of my car with the having the windshield on or whatever, like the what I'm saying is like the the car, like with the humidity, you know, like the inside of my car would fog up the outside Mm -hmm. of my car would fog up that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I just I immediately made the decision that like I just wasn't even going to. Because what's it going to prove? It's not going to prove anything. Yeah. Well, I mean, I've told the story before about finding a, a maybe footprint on the side of the road. It's in hard packed mud. I'm jumping up and down. I couldn't even make an impression. Couldn't see toes in it, but it was it was foot shaped. And you could see it, something that came down a hill. It was a wake of leaves disturbed. You could see right where it came down the hill. It looked like it stepped in the mud on the side of the road. This hard packed mud left a print. So, walked across the bridge. In the middle of the bridge, giant pile of scat. Just a huge pile of scat. Get out of here! Right in the, no, right in the direction, and then it 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 looked like it walked across, and then and then off into the the woods on the other side. And everybody asked me like, well, "Why didn't you take that scat?" I'm like, well, "What what am I going to do with a bunch of?" That's what people said about that gigantic tire size pile of crap I found out at Lake Worth. Yeah, what am I going to do with that? What'd like, you do with it? Yeah. Like, that's what Matt asked me. What'd you do with that? I was like, "What I do with it?" <laughs> Left yeah. that shit there, man. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's, it's you know, the only thing I can tell you, like I I picked through it a little bit with a stick. There were bugs in it. Whatever it was was eating bugs. It was giant. I grew up on a farm. It wasn't horse or cow. That much I can tell you. I don't think it was bear. But other than other than that, what am I? I'm going to collect this in a bag and then do what? Do you know what I mean? It's, right. It, Put it in your freezer and end up getting a divorce. That's what <laughs> exactly. Exactly. You know, there's only so much you can do. Right. And look, I, I mean, I appreciate the people who are working towards the physical proof of this creature, which you and I obviously have a philosophy about why that has not happened and why it won't happen. Right, right. But I do understand people who tend to think maybe that it is one thing or the other. I don't necessarily think the people who are dogmatic and what they think are contributing anything to the subject. But the fact of the matter is is that I could like I had one of those moments, you know, like like I'm flash forwarding in my mind, the freaking Reddit Bigfoot posts that would be going on about it. And some now, obviously, when people are hearing this, it will be posted. So I was thinking, though, about telling people that go ahead and go to the Reddit Bigfoot page, because when this episode comes out, I'm going to post it on the Reddit Bigfoot page and say, hey, this crazy guy said that he had pictures of a Bigfoot hand just to see the responses. (laughs) But I was like having this moment where I was like flash forwarding in my mind, like thinking things through ahead of time of just the insanity, the Facebook battle that would go on right people would be claiming that i was full of shit right blah blah blah. and the thing is is like it i don't care people like i don't care right like that that's the thing like i don't care i i don't even know i'm not trying to tell you that a monster put its hand on my windshield because i don't know what that means i'm just saying it's super freaking weird well, let's, before we hear the rest of your sort of Boggy Creek saga, which is which is interesting, and we got some sound clips and everything coming up, let's talk a, a little bit about the weirdness of this print, and I'm going to throw some stuff at you and just see what you think. Number one, you know, there are three-fingered prints collected and three-toed prints collected associated with this thing. And I got really excited because that's a big part of where the footprints are in the book I'm writing with Josh. And that's why I asked your permission. I was like, can I send this to Josh? I'm not saying that's what it was, but I'm just saying it's a really weird looking handprint. And you can see three distinct fingers, three long fingers. Like, right. So I'm, I mean, I'm wondering, you know, a lot of the Boggy Creek tracks were three-toed tracks, which, uh, you know, certain... Uh, shall we say big names in the community have said that every time you, you find a three-toed track, it's mer people. 
which is really freaking bizarre. Like, but I'm sorry, I'm sorry. What, what a mer? Like, is that like a mermaid or a merman? Mer- oh those- yeah, I guess I mean, they, that's his name for like lizard people. So, so when you find a three toe track, it's a, it's a oh, lizard. It's a lizard I man. Didn't, I didn't know that lizard people were mer people. I guess they are. I don't. You know, that's what he calls. Are them. they related to the sirens of yore? <laughs> you know, this is beyond my depth because. No, I think no. Stop it! That it's beyond your depth. I mean, you're swimming at the <laughs> precise depth. <laughs> All right, true, but uh, no, you know, there's plenty of three toed tracks that are associated with big hairy things that people see, and uh, I think it's it's one of these grasping at straws for these you know flesh and blood types to just say, oh, the three toed tracks are are lizard men. Well, now now you have to like if you really want to. Talk about like proving a monster. Now you're talking about two monsters, you know, what a three-toed lizard man and a big hairy monkey in the woods. It becomes a bizarre exercise. But in any case, uh, plenty of Bigfoot tracks with three toes, including uh, many around Boggy Creek. So I wonder. I mean, it's a really weird-looking handprint. You know, maybe, maybe it's a three or four-fingered print, which is it's not unheard of in in the in the world of Bigfoot. Very, very strange. But another idea, a poltergeist, they leave these greasy handprints. You know? See, that trips me out. When you told me that, I mean, that that messes with me. It's just, it's a thing. It's, you know, so it's, I don't know. It's just a, another one of these things that, that points to the weirdness of this phenomenon. No, did you hold your hand up, like kind of next to the print, just to, to to judge the size? Yeah, I I definitely did, like as best as I could, right, and took a picture of myself, mm-hmm. um, kind of trying to get like the position, like just so you could see what it right, what, like kind of what you thought, like the position of the hand. Yeah, was. so yeah. like I personally think that it's a like it would be considered like a right hand mm-hmm. because. Uh, I do think that you can see uh, what may look like it would be like the pinky, Mm -hmm. but it is not distinctive, but I could, and I don't know how much of this was, uh, you know, whatever the thing is where you're like seeing what you want to see or whatever. Like I could, I do know this, that like just the way that the, I went over this a lot in my head, like trying to figure out like, even if, if you if it was so let's say it was your left hand and like god knows where you would put your right hand but let's just say it was your left hand and you put your right hand on top of the car um again for what purposes i don't know it just the way that like the the way that they look to like it it looks like it's like a right-handed print to me personally mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. uh kind of the way that they were angled but yeah i mean i did i did take a couple of photos of mine but I didn't get anywhere you can actually not that I think that you can see like the size comparison. The best way to know like where it is in terms of size is the fact that you can see the side of my car windshield. Mm -hmm. Right. So, I mean, and those are pretty well standard. So that gives you like some, but, um, so, I mean, just estimating like compared to your hand, I mean, it looked, uh, it looked larger to me. Mm-hmm. right more than the that main, i mean the, the proportions like were that, weird again like that hair scuff or whatever yeah like, like after it, i kind of at the wrist it looks like you can almost see some hair and then the proportions are weird like the fingers are long they're you know they're right they're, and yeah. pointy yeah yeah like super pointy yeah uh, which I, a few people that i have shared it with that's like the first thing they freak out about is like Dude, it looks like a freaking. <laughs> it looks like a monkey paw, man. Kind of does, yeah. It it looks like the scary monkey paw in Gremlins. Mm-hmm. I don't know that they bought a monkey paw, but I wish that they would have they got a monkey. <laughs> but you know what I mean. The yeah, old yeah. Tool of the monkey paw. Yeah, it's, that's what it looks like, man. So, yeah, it's it's wild. I, I mean, again, I you know I'm not a handprint expert. You know, people send me pictures of physical evidence all the time and, and photographs of things in the woods. And the other thing I could usually say to people is, look, I'm, I'm not a photograph expert, but you know, this, 
looks very interesting to me or or sometimes it doesn't you know so i'll usually try to be nice and say i don't see what you're seeing but you know i trust that you were there etc cetera, etc cetera. but you know i'm not I a hand for an this. expert not i'll a... say this that of of the of the shit that i've seen people that have said like oh here's a paw mm-hmm. or here's a handprint like it's one of the best handprint photos i've ever seen i it looks great you know what i mean someone with a weird hand let's just say that much Someone with a weird hand that was very greasy put their hand on your windshield. That's right. And that much we can say. Right. This would have had to have been between the hours of one a.m. and again four thirty, five o'clock in the morning, mm-hmm. because nobody put their hand on my windshield from the moment that I cleaned it again, like meticulously cleaned it so that the video like the you know the camera the autofocus or whatever on the camera wouldn't like stop down on a splotch or whatever on my windshield from the moment that I pulled up to his house and we probably went to bed I mean we went to bed after midnight and like I said like I was up before the sun came out so something strange but also just someone would have had to have been coming through that way uh, you know, in that little window. Right. Which, I mean, many experts will tell you, Tim, it's nocturnal. <laughs> Even though 50 plus percent of sightings are during the day. But there you go. Pay no attention to the bad behind the curtain, Tim. <laughs> well, let's get a little bit into your history of this. So did all this happen at the same property, basically? Oh, man. Within 20 feet of where my feet planted when I jokingly said to Clint that, hey, let's go out here. I want to record a Bigfoot howl and let's see if we get a response. And if just the short backstory on that is that uh, there were a group of people that were down there that were filming a documentary about Boggy Creek that I had worked with. And I wanted to hang out with them because they're from Ohio and I'm from Texas and I had never physically met them. I went down there, spent some time with them. We ended up going to record an interview on Clint's property because they had recorded this interview earlier in the day and there was a shooting range in the background. Mm. And so the sounds of the guns going off and stuff had messed it up. So Anyway, they went out to this place. That's how I ended up meeting Clint. While I was there, I was like, hey, I know these guys. They've been running around in the woods in Arkansas in the summer. Well, the spring. It was April. But it was hot as all get out. And they're going to be worn out. And I kind of want to, you know, I'm a night owl anyway. I want to hang out. Can I come back by? He said, sure. So I left from Texarkana, drove down there. We're kicking it. He's playing, literally playing his banjo on his porch and his overalls when I pull up. Nice. And uh, and had not really had any experiences himself. And this is a guy who uh, works with the forestry department in the area. And um, we stand... Like there's a huge field in front of like right off of his porch and we walked out there and I screamed and I think this was my first official Bigfoot howl and the results like changed my life. I don't know what else to say about it. Well, at this point, you, like if, if I remember correctly, you were kind of like, you know, not that you thought it was all a joke, but you were kind of like not fully convinced that there was. Oh yeah. No, like it, look, I mean, I, I don't have any problems saying that. I mean, I found the humor in and of itself. Right. Mm-hmm. I, I definitely had the intrigue and in the fact that people were saying that things were going on, but the concepts in and of itself, I, I didn't really, in fact, I mean, the best place that I could get to was that, okay, maybe there is a species of ape 
that is in North America that's unidentified. Mm-hmm. Like, maybe that that's all it is. Right. But again, like, I hadn't been a part of the whole, hey, I shot a Bigfoot. Here I've got it in a trailer in Las Vegas. Come and look at its body. Like, mm-hmm. I wasn't around for any of that. Mm-hmm. I'll tell you this right now, that if I would have seen the pictures of whatever his name was that put that <laughs> Bigfoot, is that, here's my Bigfoot, I would have been like, you people are fucking bananas. Like, you're crazy. <laughs> Like, that's not real. And if you're trying to argue with me that you think it's real, like, there's something wrong with you. Yeah. Like, that was my attitude about that. Mm -hmm. But I didn't, you know, I wasn't around for any of that. Right? Like, I've I've been aware of this presence that swung its arms and looked over its shoulder and in the woods long ago. The concept of it. But wasn't anything that I was... I was the last person that was quote unquote in the community. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In fact, I found my entertainment from the way that people acted in the community. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot lot of entertainment there. There's a lot of entertainment value there. No question about it. (laughs) So yeah, no, in fact, are you going to play that clip here or are we doing that? Yeah. Let me go ahead and play that. So you had just let out a how. Your, of your yeah, own. So at the beginning of this clip, you can hear me. I say to Clint, let me give out a Bigfoot howl. And let me see if I get a response. You can hear that I'm giggling in my voice. And this is actually that this clip that you're about to play is like, that's the raw audio. All right. So that's not boosted or anything. And the one thing that I will say is that when the howl begins, and like I like I heard it and I turned my body. I'm holding my iPhone up in the air as this is occurring. I actually thought it was one long howl. And then now, of course, we know it was two. Like it was one and then a response back at it. So it was like me, one, and then another. All right. Let's go ahead and play that. Let me give a Bigfoot howl and let's see if we get a response. Is that cool? Ready? Ready? Did that just really happen? It's exact. It's exactly how I felt about it then. <laughs> and I do realize why people who have spent their life's work in and around the area and would look at me like I was the rookie of the year coming in and doing things that they had never seen before. Because as a first timer. Um, for, for that experience to occur (laughs) was pretty spectacular. Yeah. So, um, if you don't know the way that the story played out was that I freaked out the next morning I'm up as soon as I know that these guys are going to be up and I'm down outside of the hotel, like, dude, check this out. And they're very, there's, I'm getting very, very disgusted looks on people's faces back at me, but I'm also playing it off of my phone. And I think people were kind of dumbfounded that I would show up and that that would occur right. Like nobody had a camera on me, Mm -hmm. which I mean, maybe the main lesson for everyone of this whole thing is, is that I'm the star, (laughs) but, um, (laughs) but, uh, Interestingly enough, and and I mean, it wasn't played up like I thought that it should be, but so let's, so let's say that was Saturday night, 
which I don't know that that's true, but let's just say that was Saturday night, uh, rewind eight hours before that or whatever. We're on the other side of the swamp interviewing someone who is in the documentary about Boggy Creek and uh, me and this other guy, we're like away from the filming, right? Like it's to not like interfere with them. Mm-hmm. Well, while they were interviewing this guy right next to the water, and it's not as clear or clean because they're, again, they're interviewing him, so they're talking. But pretty much the exact same series of howls occurred earlier. And they reference that. And the crazy thing is that, like, if you look at them and look at both of those audio files, like, they're super similar. Mm-hmm. Which, I mean... I don't know nothing about nothing, but I mean, I think that's a great piece of information and a great piece of evidence. I just think that nobody wanted to, uh, to have old Clinton, the thunder thief from Dallas come in and <laughs> spoil things, but that occurs. So <laughs> again, I, I don't know what to think about any of it. And the only person that was really quote unquote in the community that I knew was Cliff Barrickman who is a fantastic guitar player and also just happens to be uh, kind of a big deal in the Bigfoot community and had been on our podcast recently and he and I hit it off and we talked about a lot of things other than Bigfoot, but I'm sitting in the hotel and I actually text him that audio file. He's like, Hey, you should send it to this guy, David up in the Northwest and, And, uh, little, I mean, kind of blew me away that I would be told by one of these foremost audio experts that they considered that kind of one of the top five audio files of all time recorded, Wow! which I don't understand how that's the case, but that's how real that situation was. Let's just put it that way. Well, before we get, we have a, a comparison clip of that to a, another howl that was recorded in the Northwest. But before we get to that, so what did you do for the rest of the night? You get you, you, you howl, you get the howl returned. Were you freaked out? Did you just hang out? What, what was? The, Dude, I uh, probably said to him, "Can you believe, like, what the heck?" And Clint, the funny thing is that Clint is this way, is that he was just like, "I don't know, man. Maybe you stirred him up, man." Like he. Like, he obviously heard it. Mm-hmm. He may or may not have been imbibing in something and <laughs> been a little bit looped out. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I sat, like, I seriously, I couldn't pick my jaw up off the floor. Right, yeah. yeah. And I could make, right, like, I maybe would try to carry on. Like, he would ask me a question about something that had nothing to do with that. And halfway through my sentence, right, that's all I was thinking about. Mm-hmm. And so, I went. I went back to the hotel. I did not make it very long before, you know, like I wasn't able to get much sleep. I couldn't wait for those other guys to get up and be out so that I could share it with someone who would be into it. Right. Yeah. 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 No. And I mean, when I say that it changed my life, I mean that it changed my life and that I don't think that, well, like speaking of devil's Creek. I don't think that I ever would have ended up at Devil's Creek had it not been for that particular event. Right. I mean, I know I wouldn't have been. Yeah, it sort of set you on the path. Yeah, but I mean, just like with so many other things in the field of the weird and the paranormal, and maybe it's the reason that I enjoy it so much, is that there are things that occur... <laughs> That that they defy explanation. Sure. And I've had, as have you, several things happen to me that have defied explanation. Mm-hmm. This would would happen to be one of them. Yeah, yeah. That, and, uh, that does not seem to be a coyote for it uh, at all. So let's play this second clip, which is the comparison of the two. Right.
Yeah, it's not a coyote. No. And there's a whole thing about why the like the scientific argument for why it's not a coyote, which people can check out in depth in the subsequent OKT mm-hmm. uh, OK Talk episodes about it, the analysis of a Bigfoot howl and all that. We don't have to get into all that. No, no. Yeah, I know people have done the whatever the spectrograms or whatever they are and and compared it to, to you know, all known animals and all that, but uh I mean just listening to it, it's not a coyote. Like it's just not Right. Yeah. I would agree with you on that point. So as fate would have it, it wasn't let's see, that happened in April by August of that year. This was twenty sixteen. I had been contacted by someone who you know very well, a man by the name of James, who this is how <laughs> this is how serious that was was that I'm getting contacted from people all over the globe, right? Like uh, my good friend Jarrah in California is saying how he played it in front of tribal elders out there during a meeting. I'm getting this. You know, I mean, this James, who's in Maryland, wants to drive to Falk, Arkansas, because people were like, holy crap. Yeah, now James is, going, is uh, not the James that sometimes hosts the show with me, but the guy I refer to as JR. He was with me, if listeners remember, all the way back to the time at Site 7 where we saw the, the weird lights in the woods and we were hitting them with lasers James was the the he was the owner of the laser in question that we were hitting the lights with and and uh, they were changing colors and turning out and moving around and doing all kinds of funny stuff. That is the same fella. So uh, and James is a superstar. James gave Scott Harriet a, a ride, <laughs> which is detailed in a Bigfoot episode long ago. An episode <laughs> of the Bigfoot Show. Shout out to the Bigfoot Show. We miss you, the Bigfoot Show. Yeah, he's a solid dude, too. He's a excellent, excellent guy to do this kind of stuff with. He's, he's a great hiking partner. I, if, you're, if you're listening, buddy, I miss you. He moved. Yeah, to, oh, he, think, he, he will be listening. I think he moved to uh, Oklahoma, I believe. So I haven't oh, seen he him. oh, he did. He went to go commune with the apes. <laughs> and <laughs> I don't just mean Sasquatch. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> And I can say that because I live in Texas and everyone knows why Texas will never fall into the Gulf of Mexico. You know that, right, Tim? I'm not sure. Because Oklahoma sucks. <laughs> ah! <laughs> no, he's actually in a beautiful part of the state. The eastern portion of Oklahoma is a bizarre and wondrous land. And there is definitely some strange things that go on in McCurtain County. That cannot be denied. It just so happens that I don't think that it's Jane Goodall in the right. woods up there. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, but no, so James contacts me. He wants to come down. I, for some reason, was a much more trusting boy at this time, Tim. Very innocent. Very <laughs> innocent. And uh, I agree to meet up with him. And I actually he beat me there. Like he was at Clint's place and I met him there and we hung out for a couple of days and I had met through a wonderful, wonderful person who works for the city of Texarkana, whose name is Amber, a guy named Wayne, who again, if you want to hear all these stories, okay, talk podcasts, boggy Creek stuff, it's all there. We went, to a another massive piece of property where we heard all kinds of stories and James bought like some specific recorders. So earlier in the night, we actually were in pretty close proximity to Clint's place. As in like, there's the Crabtree house, right? Like mm-hmm. right over there. And, um, look, this is August in Arkansas and it's oppressively hot. 
but they also say that's kind of like peak movement time for these things, which I can imagine if you were living in the woods, you would be uncomfortable, especially if you're super hairy, which again, I don't understand All right. the, the why, like why. But anyway, we heard something and walk up to the wood line behind us and growl at us, which I mean, that it freaked me out. I'll just say this. Fout did not disappoint. Mm -hmm. Right. And so this time we go back, it's just the two of us as in there's the two of us outsiders. There's no crew of people. And so some of this stuff that you're about to play, and we played a couple of them on OK Talk, but I'll just, man, Tim, this portion of the whole thing, it was too much, man. Like at this point, if ever there was a place where they would say something was a hot spot, right? I would imagine this would be it because it seemed like every time I played something back on a recorder, like a couple of these audio files, I heard the response physically, but it was like every time I was, <laughs> every time I was turning on the recorder and recording something, something was happening. And, you know, I, I don't have any desire for someone to think that <laughs> that this is like the, it, it, it just it, it was it was too much in terms of like, I feel like I could go down there right now and scream into the woods and something would scream back at me. That's honestly how I feel. Mm -hmm. I don't know what good it would do for people. At some point, it's just like, man, that place is bananas. Right. But there, uh, we have audio on tops of audio on tops of audio. So usually with the podcast, I only play the stuff like that I'm either trying to make a point or I'll ch pick and choose. So a couple of these, um, I, don't, I don't think we ever played on the pod. At least we certainly didn't just like signal it like – specifically say hey check this out mm -hmm. this like this next one that you're about to play would fall into that category so i would consider this a debut okay so so what are we about to hear so this would be me howling into the arkansas night at a different obviously in august rather than april mm -hmm. and a response that i think is rather significant all right let's go ahead and hit that one What are your thoughts on that? Ooh, you know, I mean, you've heard this stuff out in the woods, man. Yeah, yeah. I th that's like what we were getting at Pandemonium. Pandemonium 2019, <laughs> featuring Tim Renner. Yeah, we've yet to go back. Uh, we're going to go back here soon and see what we can get to, and. and and do a little more hiking through there. It's, it's uh, fraught with rattlesnakes, so we didn't want to do too much uh, climbing through through the rocks and stuff. But what's the deal with you Yankees, man? Like I, I heard people in Canada complaining about rattlesnakes too, man. I'm just like, hello. Yeah, we well, you got those calm desert rattlers down there. We got we got these timber rattlers. They're quicker and meaner. Okay, first of all, clearly you don't understand that I live in the timber. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, if uh, I'll tell you what, man, like let's let's like cross our fingers that that we may get a little bit of break in the snow like mid January and I'll be able to go with you. Yeah. Pandemonium was intense, but no, that's the kind of that's the that's makes me think of what I heard. So I was woken up, I told you this, I was woken up by wood knocks. Three thirty in the morning, got them on tape. And then we just had the recorder running, and then we, we started getting these howls like that. And it was, even uh, Chad, who was with me, 
he, you can hear him on the tape. He says, is that a siren? I'm like, no, it's not a siren. We're six miles from nowhere. It's not a siren. You or know? was it a siren, though? A siren of the wood. Well, there you go. And you asked me what I think about this. I'm going to go ahead and play, play that one again because that kind of gave me chills. You know what comes to mind when I hear that? Banshee. Mm-hmm. Banshee. That's what comes to mind. Mm-hmm. Not like a monkey. That. Not a monkey. A banshee. Yeah, it's, like it's just chilling. Chilling, chilling sound. Well, so speaking of monkey, is that is that next one? Next one is Hal of Interest, I have. Okay, yeah. So, again, it must be a Hal of Interest. Let's, right. let's examine. So this is the same trip in August. Yep, yep. All right. Right, yeah. So that's the same shorter one looped five times. Mm -hmm. Which, again... The weird thing about this stuff is that at no point, right? Like, so if I'm in East Texas, let's say at a graveyard, let's say called Werewolf Road, right? And I howl, and coyotes get going, like they keep going, right? Mm-hmm. They're, mm-hmm. you know, the whole thing. Yeah, and they usually have a yip, like a yip yip howl. Mm-hmm. Oh. Yeah, mm-hmm. right. Really freaks me out. <laughs> About the uh, that werewolf road coyote howl that we have in the uh, in an episode or two, a few back, whatever. Yeah, uh, and which you can find the, look up werewolf. There seems to be, there seems to be like, like some like sort of scream that tells him to shut up. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's like real sudden. It's like, Wah! and then they they stop their yapping. Here's the deal. So the the one the clip previous to that. These are when we're actively doing stuff. That howl was captured on a recorder that was placed on a log way out in the middle of nowhere. So far that, I, honestly, I didn't think James could find the thing because he ended up going to retrieve it. This was uh, not a nice area to get to. In fact, if anything, James is a, like, I'm going to have a pistol on my hip, and if a raccoon comes out of that bush, I may pull my gun on it thinking that it's a monster. Mm -hmm. But he will also, like, go through some pretty nasty territory. Like, the dude is ready to roll. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's that's one of the reasons I loved hiking with him. Yeah. Like, he's prepared. Yeah. Ain't scared to get dirty, nasty, all of that. There was a wall of mosquitoes that would raise off of the swamp down there at dusk that became the kind of cloud that you would expect to form Voldemort. <laughs> when you write, like, the nastiest, worst thing of all time, like, that would that literally makes it impenetrable i'll just say that i'm i mean like where you, when you're breathing they're coming in your nose right like right. Uh, best case for an atheist mosquitoes and james like went into this area put this put this recorder on this log took a picture of it prior and then took a picture of it after the fact and that's important only because the last clip we're going to play, but this next one. So that howl was just randomly captured in the middle of the night. Right. Mm -hmm. So then this next clip too, randomly captured in the middle of the night. And this one is interesting because it's like something does that again with the howling thing. And then there's like chatter. Well, let's go ahead and play it. Thank you. 
Yeah, that's weird sounding stuff. Now, that's at night. Yeah, so that would have been overnight, Mm -hmm. right? Like, we're not around there or anything. Again, that's just stuff that we picked up going back and reviewing the audio. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, I mean, I guess the weird thing is that, like, Yeah. Weird. It's not so much as, see, like, it's not even so much as like that, like uh, that chatter that sounds like m- like literal monkeys barking at each other. No, it's just a, a weird. It's really weird. It's like like a series of whoops almost or something. Right, like howl, fade into whoop 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 whoop. Yeah, which, yeah. Which which again, just bizarre. And I mean, hey, if you're a total skeptic or whatever, and you like, if you think you know what that is, like. Get at me because I don't know. Sure, yeah, yeah, and that, and that's what I always say when I play this stuff. It's like, look, all I can say is I don't know what it was. You know, I can't tell you what it was that was doing it. And but for me, the most compelling stuff has been for me, you know, the, the stuff I've recorded has been Pandemonium, which you know I had some people say, oh, it's just a coyote, but far fewer than usually any sound I play that I've recorded. Someone will say, oh, that's a coyote. Uh, you know, I'll get a, a rash of people, but uh, those Pandemonium sounds. Uh, for the most part, people weren't saying that. I did get one person say it was an owl, but uh, that is one powerful owl if they're if they're doing that kind of scream. But in any case, yeah, it's you know maybe maybe somebody knows what it is, but uh, it certainly sounds weird. All right, so there's another thing that, like, we'll just put this out there, right? Like you and I have discussed how this thing could be something other. Mm-hmm. And one thing that, and all the audio that was coming out of Devil's Creek that was really strange was there were things that seemed to happen that were, I would say, like almost native. I don't know how else to describe it. Almost like, like there's a big thing if you've ever seen the greatness that is Lonesome Dove, and if you haven't, then you should, but... Uh, if you want to know, this is kind of what I'm talking about, like how Comanches would communicate. Mm-hmm. Native American Comanches would produce this like bark screech in rapid succession that is terrifying. And um, if you can imagine you're a native peoples and you're fighting a invading Euro population <laughs> that is not familiar with the surroundings. They were very good at making signals with noise. The the whole like, (laughs) right? Like, right. Right. Like way of like getting someone's attention. So when I hear this, that you're about to play this bark and crow, it may just be a bark and a crow. Again, it may Mm is in the middle of the night. I don't know. Like I, I don't randomly just hear one crow say one thing one time. Usually, maybe, maybe they do. But considering where we are, this is something that I just think is interesting. And and like just like with the other stuff, I just want to. I always like to hear what other people think about it. All right, so this is bark and crow, and this is looped five times. Alrighty. It's just really weird in the middle of nothing. Yeah, exactly. Which I say the middle of nothing, but again, you can obviously hear the sounds of the southern forest Mm -hmm. and the swamp. But it's just weird. And again, that recorder wasn't placed. It's not like that's a neighborhood, right? Like, just you know, like, there's just some random dog out there. And maybe even that was a random, I, I don't know. Right. But if you're in the woods or you're in the middle of nowhere, there's, there's a reason why certain things occur. 
If that second, if that, you know, right, it's like bark, bark, crow, right? If that is a crow, like what in the hell is a crow doing awake in the middle of the night and making that noise Mm -hmm. once? Because that's the thing, right? It's like that pops up in the middle of a lengthy recording file. So there's reason for that, and that is what we are about to play next, which this, I think this will it's going to be controversial just because of what I'm going to say, but I'm going to propose this to you as what, what I think is going on here. Or I'll tell you what, let me just tell you this recorder, a zoom recorder. It looks like a, it's like a cylinder, right? Mm-hmm. And, uh, James set it on a downed tree, which is obviously rounded because trees are cylinders of forest wood (laughs) and um he has it sitting on this tree right and this happened in the middle of the night right but it happened like around when some of this other stuff happened as in like within an hour right of the one of those howls and, and that thing that we just listened to so just play it and then and then let's talk about it and maybe play it again and see. I want to tell you what our initial analysis of this audio was. All right. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and play that clip one more time. Okay. It sounds like what you have it labeled as. <laughs> so I guess I guess I'm cheating, but it does sound like something's messing with the recorder. Yeah, so the interesting thing is there that the first, at the beginning of that, it almost sounds like there's a couple of footsteps, Mm -hmm. like approaching. Again, this recorder is on a log, standing straight up. If um, you were a muskrat and you ran across that log and bumped into that recorder, it would end up on the ground. If you were a raccoon who thought that that was an interesting looking thing and you were going to pick it up, maybe you could set it back down. But the fact of the matter is that it, it was that audio of that is that it gets picked up off of the piece of wood and set back down. When he returned, you said he had taken photos of it when he was there. So when he returned, it was in a different position. It was just, it was still standing straight up. I don't know that it had been like picked up and moved to the end of the log. I'm not trying to say that. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> right. Like it was just that it wasn't on the ground or knocked over or. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If it, it was, if it was a crow messing with something shiny, you would think it would, you know, push it over. If it was a squirrel. It would put pebbles in it to make the water level rise. Exactly. If it was a squirrel, you'd think it would knock it over. You know, again, I'm reminded of our pandemonium visit with the cedar ball that was pushed right to the very edge of the rock and not pushed off. It's like, if it, you'd think it was an animal, if it was a squirrel that was doing it, it would have you know, pushed it off. Why stop perfectly balanced on the edge? But it's, it's a very similar thing. If an animal is going to mess with it, you'd think it would knock it over or carry it off, you know, whatever. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah, so... Falk, Arkansas, check it out. <laughs> yeah, I mean, man, I like. No, I, I've um, always loved the the Boggy Creek movie, and a lot of people, oh, it's so cheesy. I've loved it. I I, I love the uh, the sort of half documentary uh, that they made with it. I find it charming, and the you know the effects are what they are. It's very low budget, but I find the story charming and uh, super interesting. And right, I, and again, like the people that play that this happened to them they're in it right yeah yeah exactly uh, so there's something really and we may have told this story it i'm sure it's out there i'll just put it this way but 
there was a, sh- a television show that was on A&E called, uh, I don't know what it was called. But anyway, basically it was about people who needed gigantic equipment or just things that were huge moved across the country. Mm-hmm. Okay. In that field, you, let's say you are a mover, like you bid to move this. Like, let's say you've got the Statue of Liberty in your backyard right. and you want to move it to New York, right? Like people bid for that job. Like they say like how low they'll go to do it and then they do it. And this a and show recorded that kind of thing. Well, there's this guy who lives there in Falcon, went to his house or whatever. And um, he uh, like had some gigantic piece of farm equipment or something that needed to be moved. Something like that. Anyway, so that A&E show was there with the person who was going to move it. And uh, as the story goes... There's a producer that's there with his cameraman and they're making jokes about how they had gone to the Monster Mart and this Bigfoot, the guy's just clowning on the whole scene. And a few minutes later, he has to go back out to the car to get something. And this driveway to this place, like the house is like way back towards a pond on the back of the property. So like the, you have to go all the way towards the road, which the road isn't even, I wouldn't even consider it. Like, it's not like a two lane highway for sure. It's just like a road. Mm -hmm. Like, and it would be scary if you had to like have two cars going in opposite directions down it, but it backs up again to this just fence line of, trees and vines and things that will bite you, sting you, kill you kind of impenetrable nastiness, right? If you're at, you're standing at this driveway with your back to the road, 15, 20 feet over there is just, there's, I'm, I'm sure there's a fence there, but it's just like, right. It's just forest woods. And, this producer had to run out and get something for the camera equipment. He opens up the trunk of their car and he's like leaning over. This is the middle of the day. He's leaning over into the trunk and hears something behind him growl and turns around and looks. And there is in this forest line, just this like black as night shadow that is just like right past the initial leaves and that that guy that owned that house just said that the kid just freaked out <laughs> freaked out right like it was kind of like me like oh let's give a bigfoot howl blah, blah, blah. and then bigfoot howls right or whatever right right um this kind of situation like oh we're in the spooky woods blah, blah, blah. and then something completely terrifying happens the thing is even though i'm not the person that makes this argument by any stretch of the imagination anymore just because of the things that I've seen or whatever. But this is a place where if something was living out there in the woods and you tried to go get it, it would be hard for you. That's all I'll say. It's right. difficult. Right. It's well, difficult to move out there. Yeah. Yeah. That's the thing with this stuff. There are some, you know, compelling arguments. And I think that's part of muddying the water that, you know, that, that, the, you know, the other, as I call it, it's, there are enough compelling arguments that make some things about this seem like, you know, maybe there really could be something out there. And if, if well, there I do be, think that there's something out there at some points. Yeah. Oh, just, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Right? Agreed. I just, you know, a breeding population of giant ape men. You know, that's another story. Hey, so this isn't something that we talked about at all beforehand, but I just want to throw this out there. Have you seen the new Bigfoot show? I have not. Dude. Really well done. I, I've, I've been hearing good things about it. Yeah, this is uh, Expedition Bigfoot, I believe, right? Really, really well done. Now, I personally, I'm not even lying. I watched it the other night. Didn't, haven't read, like, I, I avoid 
things at this point, right? I don't want sure. my um, yeah. I don't want my shit to be contaminated in any way, shape, or form. So it's not as if I'm ghosting a community. It's just that I'm working on my own shit. Don't have time for it. So I'm not online at all in that way, shape, or form. So I didn't know, hadn't heard anybody say anything about it. Watched it the other night. About 35 minutes into it, I had to pause it. And I was doing something and I was thinking to myself, man, you know, the best part about this is that we're this far into it. And I haven't heard Dr. Meldrum's name. (laughs) That's not a shot at Dr. Meldrum. Right, right. Like, I'm not taking a shot at Dr. Meldrum. No, no. At all. But dude is on every television program about Bigfoot ever, right? Like, it's yeah, just like, yeah. here we, you know, I mean, I could literally sit there and tell you if there was some special on the science channel about Bigfoot, like I could write it out to you, then you could watch it. And my outline of it would be so close that you would think I was Nostradamus, right? Like, that's how predictable all this stuff is happening. And I was just like thinking to myself, I was like, this, the, that's the best part of this, right? Number one, the episode is really good. Something strange happens at the end, which is like a lot of things in the Bigfootery, very weird and kind of dramatic. And I don't know that it needed to be, but whatever. Unfortunately, unfortunately, in the, the there's like a in the weeks to come. Mm hmm. Trailer at the end of it, I'm pretty sure Meldrum is in there. Yeah. And I, like, oh. I, I think it's under anyone's contract if they make a Bigfoot TV show in America that he has to be in it at some point. How does he have like a global fucking contract though? How does he have? <laughs> it's like, it's, he, man. It's well, like, he, he's got a doctor in front of his name and it, it immediately lends credibility to any production, I think, in, in people's minds. you know. I'm just going to say that I'm going to argue that at this point it takes away credibility. And, you know, I'm not saying like just his, his existence takes away credibility. I'm saying that maybe, maybe we've heard from you plenty. And like when you are the only thing that is there to lend credibility to it, maybe you start to have the opposite reaction. Effect. Yeah. Well, it's... and again, super sweet guy, super right. sweet dude. And, and is one of these people that is in this community that I 100% believe is not trying to BS people. No, no, me either. And I, I may not agree with everything he says, but I don't think he's purposefully faking crap right, for his own amusement. Agree. What I usually say about Dr. Meldrum is this, and again, I don't know him. He seems like a great guy. Don't have any bad feelings about him, but what I usually say about him is this. He knows so much about primate foot anatomy that I could spend the rest of my life trying to catch up, and I would never know as much as Dr. Meldrum knows about primate foot anatomy. He's a wealth of information about that, and about footprints and foot structure and foot anatomy. You should trust everything he says because he knows so much, but he doesn't really know anything about Bigfoot. Yeah, right, because, again, we don't know what we're dealing exactly. with. Exactly, exactly. So don't, but I will say don't this, confuse man, so the this, two. So there's something really interesting that is happening in this show, Again, unless unless they're pulling the wool over my eyes, which I don't think is happening. But for those of you who have been paying attention to podcasts in the community for a long time, there was this whole thing. I think it was called the Erickson Project, maybe. Okay. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But essentially what it was was the guy saying, like, we need to get money for drones because we're just going to have drones going. Uh, OK, over. yeah, I remember. Yeah. Right. Mm hmm. And the argument then at that time was, well, that's great, but all you're going to see is the top of the tree canopy, right? Mm -hmm. They show some, like, scary NSA footage here of ground mapping that is occurring from this pissed-off drone that, dude, like, it looks like you take the top off the lid, and it's like you can see the individual areas, but like you're getting right, like you're getting topography maps, like super precise too. It's wow. crazy. Wow. And through that, they 
they identify what looks to be game trails or whatever, which mm-hmm. you can imagine. Okay. Like if I told you fly that drone over this forest area, you wouldn't expect to be able to like look down and be like, Oh yeah, there's the game trail mm-hmm. like through the trees. You wouldn't. Right. Yeah. No. So it's impressive. It's uh, refreshing. Again, nobody take any offense to any of this. It's just, it's nice to have, different people commenting and i will say this the woman that is on here that i i don't know why it is that that scientist has to be a female in a bigfoot show like when you're putting it together right like (laughs) yeah yeah all these parts right but um like i knew who she was immediately like and she discovered this uh the like the smallest lemur in the world the Mm -hmm. smallest Mm primate but like her video footage of her in the congo where the silverback gorillas are charging her is like that's something i saw years ago and is whoa Mm -hmm. right like it's right there in her face so i like it i i i'm not gonna lie to you i can't imagine the people who assume that they should have been the experts that were there (laughs) Because I don't know any of the people on there, aside from the scientists. Like, I'd never heard of any of them. And maybe that maybe it's good on me. But, like, there's a dude that says he has a podcast, never heard of it. People who say they're experts, never heard of them. And I'm not saying, right, like, I'm the encyclopedia of this community. All I'm saying is I do know people in the community who have to be looking at it being like, oh, that guy is a pother. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Yeah, I've, I've heard some of that grumbling, actually. Should have been me, not, and I'm not saying that it should not be me. But uh, no, it should have been I, me and you. But you in a Gandalf hat. That would be a far different and possibly more entertaining show. Oh, there's no question it'd be more entertaining. Did I ever tell you about the the reality show I pitched, the Sasquatch reality show I pitched? I didn't hear about the one you pitched. I, I heard about I, I the pitched other this, stuff. There, there's a local film company that does reality shows, and I pitched this to them, and they wanted nothing to do with this and in fact closed down all contact with me after <laughs> after the is pitch. this recent no this is a couple years back okay and uh the title of the show was shroomin with sasquatch shut up and my premise was to have a different substance every week and have a, a group of people go out in the woods and get out of their mind on a different on substance. psychedelics looking for Bigfoot. Yeah, yeah, and just basically be in the woods, and they wanted nothing. They were like, no, we you we cannot do that. We cannot show that. I'm like, well, you don't have to show it. You can kind of work around it. And they're like, no, we want nothing to do with this. So, Dude, I mean, it, you may have been too early, because, like, think about it. Now, right, like, the psychedelic movement, men, we're curing depression and stuff. Oh, Microdosing yeah. is, like, a big deal. With people who are making stuff happen. Well, look, um, if, if there's any production companies out there and they want to fund Shroomin with Sasquatch, I'm just going to say I'm, I'm open to it. Well, um, if you're out there and you would like to see Shroomin with Sasquatch, I'm a production company, so holla at me and we'll do it. There you because go. I would be down for that. This does remind me to tell everyone that if you have not seen it, have you ever seen Hykea? No. Um, YouTube, Hikea. All I know, I'm, I think they have a whole thing going, but there's an episode where a guy and girl take acid and try to put together a bookcase. It's fantastic. <laughs> Spectacular. Okay. Awesome. Hey, back to Boggy Creek. I'm going to plug something here. Shut uh, up. I have made a Boggy Creek poster. It is uh, offset printed. It's uh, quite nice, I what? believe. And it's my artwork, so it's sort of an alternate movie poster for Boggy Creek. And I will put a link in the description. I'll make sure I have it up on my Etsy store and some other places. And I'll put a link in the show notes. So if anybody wants my Boggy Creek poster, signed and numbered, edition of 100 only. I'll, I'll how make... did you do that? Like, did you, uh, how did you get the reprint of it? The re- reprint. I did. I drew my own. It's, it's my art. So, so I, you, just, I know you drew it. Then yeah. how did you make a hundred of them? Did you draw oh, it a hundred times? No, 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 no. I, I, I uh, there's a local printing company that I work with. Very, very excellent uh, printing company. 
uh, okay. Wise Printing. I'll give them a shout out. Uh, lo- yeah, local to we, me in Pennsylvania, and uh, they they we, offset we, printed the posters for me. We definitely yeah. Shout out to Wise. Shout out Timmy's a fantastic artist. If you don't know, and as I know, you're not looking at me on Skype, but I'm looking at some of my own artwork over my shoulder, and the discussion has come up recently about using um, some auction stuff with my art for funding some of the stuff that we need to fund oh, and this yeah. was something that i wanted to discuss with you just not on the pod but um tim's fantastic it, i would just say that if he puts some art up don't think that you're such a special person that you can send him an email and say yes i will take these to put in a museum <laughs> for me to sell at a museum for my own personal gain i own bigfoot right exactly um Clint, you have either just released or will soon just release a new OK Talk, right? Yeah, maybe. Um, <laughs> we're we're uh, sort of like, it, we're recording this before it's released, but we're not sure if you're going to get that released before I get this released or whatever. But there should be a new OK Talk at some point soonish. Right. And look, look man, like uh, I know a lot of your listeners have supported the Devil's Creek Project. And I super really appreciate that. And again, if anyone wants to get involved with that, they're more than willing and check out Devil's Creek Film, hit us up, OK Talk Podcast, all of that. You can find us. But working on several things at the moment, as in that this is my only focus these days. So, you know, stay tuned. I, I had gone dark during the summer but there's much more to come, folks. Right on. Right on. And we will put those uh, handprint photos up at devilscreekfilm.com, yes? Yeah, and you're going to put all these links up in your thing and yep. what have you? Yeah, I'll put all the links up and links to OK Talk and, and everything. So It's been a year, I think, just about since you've been on Strange Familiar, so let's not have it be that long <coughs> again. Okay, brother? Yeah, I know. And people may be getting more of me and you than they even ever expected. Right on. Right on. I hope so. All right. I'll talk to you soon, Clint. Love you, buddy. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for listening, everybody. I would like to thank Jason W. for the very, very nice PayPal donation this week. Jason, thank you very much. Some of that music is on the way. And remember, you can always find us at strangefamiliars.com. We will be back soon with another episode of Strange Familiars. Strange Familiars is a production of Dark Holler Arts, music, books, art, podcasts, and more. DarkHollerArts.com Intro and background music is by Stone Breath. Go to stonebreath.bandcamp.com for more. We are on Facebook, facebook.com slash strangefamiliars, where you can also find the Strange Familiars Gathering Group. And we are on Instagram, at strangefamiliars. Hi, Tim. My name is Shannon, and I have a story for your podcast. Around 2006, I had gone to bed one night. Uh, my husband at the time was downstairs. And I had a, a large dog named Shadow who was lying sort of person style on the bed next to me with his head on a pillow. So I'm rolled over and I feel my dog lift his head off the pillow as if to look at something. So I roll over to see what he's looking at and there's a man materializing at the edge of, uh, of the bed on Shadow's side. And uh, the more I look at him, the clearer he becomes, almost like my eyes are adjusting to see him, the same way your eyes adjust to see something in the dark. That's what it felt like. And once he finished materializing, he stepped around to where my dog was, and he pointed a device at me. And it was sort of a, it kind of reminded me of a K2 device or one of those things you see ghost hunters use. It's very strange. And then... Just the same way he appeared, he began to fade out and disappear.
And once he was gone, my dog put his head back down on the pillow, and strangely, I rolled over and just went to sleep. And when I woke up the next morning, I thought about this, and I realized how bizarre it was, both of our behaviors, that we both just were like, okay, so this is happening now, and neither one of us was afraid. It felt like I was in uh, an altered state of consciousness. And I now have heard enough accounts to know that other people sometimes feel that way, too. So as for the man's appearance, he had short, dark hair. He was wearing uh, close-fitting, normal-looking clothes. I mean, almost like a Star Trek person, maybe, but not really. You know, just sort of like a close-fitting, long-sleeve shirt, uh, some sort of nondescript, lighter-colored pants. You know, he was a normal human being. He didn't look like he was from the past or necessarily from the future. And later on, when I started seeing these ghost hunter shows and they were walking around pointing these devices, I thought, was I a ghost in his world? Was he pointing some sort of a ghost detection tool at me? Anyway, just something that I thought of. So that's my story. Thanks. Thank you. 